Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, sorry to talk about publication ethics and ethical issues at three o'clock in the afternoon when <clears throat> a lot of you would be happy taking a snooze. Uh, I would definitely be at least today. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we've got to go through this. Let's try and see if we can make it a little interesting as we go along. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Read through this, and uh, while I'm not there with you physically, but just think about it and think what you what you believe would be would be the right thing. And in a moment, I'll I'll talk you through this slide as well, and and give you various options and opinions. Okay, so I have read through it. So I presume all of you have read through it. I also presume that you've made up your minds on whether there is a problem or not. Now, uh, most of the workshops that I go to, the first reaction is, well, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. People are a little unsure. Uh, so to my mind, what is important is to be transparent. If you're using some material that you've already created before, even if you're the owner, it's absolutely imperative that if you use the material again, you try and disclose this information to the people who are going to read this information. So uh, if there are any surgeons in the audience uh, who may have heard of the name of a person called Bloomgard, uh, who wrote a famous uh, textbook on hepatopancreatic mobility surgery, and who's uh, for a lot of us a legend as far as uh, HPB surgery is concerned, uh, at one of these workshops that I keep doing, somebody walked up to me and showed me two articles with uh, uh, different titles, but the name Leslie Humphrey Bloomgard written under them as the author. And uh, interestingly, the articles were almost the same. There was hardly any difference. No difference in the figures and hardly any difference in the text. Now, what he was describing was a method of doing a surgical procedure. He obviously must have described the procedure first time around. And then the second time around, when he uh, met somebody who was a friend of his, who was an editor of a journal, who asked him to go ahead and give him another article, he must have decided to, being as busy as he was, he must have decided to uh, give him that procedure article to, to go ahead and publish. What he did not do was to say, this has been reproduced from, or has been adapted from, or is exactly similar to whatever the instance may have been, to an article previously published in this, this journal, but this is reference and bibliography. So whenever you publish, the key element is to tell people, this is what I'm doing, and be absolutely transparent. You know, if you're a thief, you go and steal something. If you get caught, the reason you're called a thief is because you didn't tell people that you were going to steal that stuff. I had gone to the police and told them, look, I'm going to go to this person's house and steal. And then they caught me. I said, see, I told you I had I was going to steal. Huh? So the, 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 the thing that is important in publication ethics is to be as transparent and as honest as possible. Next slide, please. So what is scientific misconduct? Behavior or actions not conforming to ethical standards in conducting research and publishing research. And today we're going to talk about publishing research, not conducting research. Uh, so in both aspects, there could be scientific misconduct. Now, as far as publishing research is concerned, uh, next slide, please. Does it occur? That's a big question. So in 1974, uh, Summerlin, an immunologist, uh, doing some experiments, wanted to get a renewal of his grant, hadn't succeeded with the experiments, sitting in, uh, in, the, in the car going to the funding agency to present, he decided to paint a black patch on a white mouse to show that his experiments had actually worked. Now, there are different angles to the story. Somebody says, he did this while in the lab. Somebody says he did it while in the car. Somebody says something else. But the fact of the matter is that he fudged. And because he fudged, he got caught. He got, had mud on his face. 
1994, the U.S. Congress, the equivalent of our parliament, was concerned with the rising number of cases of scientific misconduct and therefore set up a committee to look at all the cases. And at that time, they documented 57 cases. There are hundreds and thousands now. There's a huge controversy over the discovery of streptomycin, the Nobel Prize for which was awarded in 1952. Albert Schatz and Selman Waxman, Schatz, the, 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 the mentor, the senior, and uh, the student, uh, the controversy was actually as to who did the work actually. A lot of you would have heard of the name of Eugene Bronwald. Nobody would have heard of the name of John Darcy. Eugene Bronwald was the editor-in-chief of the principles of uh, Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine for a number of years. Famous cardiologist used to work at the Harvard Medical School. And he uh, was involved in a multi-center project. Now, all the other centered had results which were different from his. But because he was Bronwald, nobody wanted to challenge him. But finally, when everybody found that things weren't going the way Brownwall Center seemed to be working things out, they all decided to go to the funding agency, which was the National Institutes of Health in the US, and say, look, there's something amiss. And they found that John Darcy, who was a fellow working with Eugene Brownwald, a research fellow working with Eugene Brownwald, had actually done no work. He just fabricated experiments fabricated results, and uh, everybody believed him. David Baltimore, was a Nobel laureate, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, had to step down because he did nothing. Because somebody in a lab which was under him said that there was some fraudulent work that was going on in the lab. So there was a whistleblower there, and because of the, the controversy raised, he had to step down from his position as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Some of you may have heard of this, but uh, I'm quite sure a lot of you have not. There's a paper on breast cancer. Uh, so those of you who are oncologists in the audience would be aware of the fact that one of the conferences uh, uh, eagerly awaited in the oncology community is the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting in the US. And the media covers this meeting very, very carefully, uh, the health media in the US. So there's a paper presented at one of these meetings where somebody showed that in about 70 odd women who had metastatic breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer to the bone, if they were offered bone marrow transplants, they had excellent results. The strong lobby of uh, women with breast cancer in the United States, and they all, including some first ladies, ex-first ladies, and uh, they all pushed very hard for this to be offered as treatment with the insurance companies and with, uh, with the, 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 the Medicaid and Medicare people. However, people were not convinced and they started investigating. And they found this was a single author abstract from South Africa, and when they started investigating further, they found that the experiments had actually never been done. There was a handful of women who had actually undergone bone marrow transplants, and the results were nowhere near what, uh, what were claimed to be. More recently, some of you may recall a gentleman from Korea, a scientist from Korea. His, his, uh, uh, the controversy was splashed on the first cover of uh, on the first page of on the cover page of Times, and uh, there was he was accused accused of fraudulent research related to stem cells, and again, uh, unfortunately, this episode ended up badly uh, with the gentleman actually uh, committing suicide. So uh, it does occur. So research misconduct does occur, and publication misconduct does occur. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are anesthetists and sitting in the audience, uh, I have nothing against them. In fact, I have an anesthetist sitting at home. So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the consortium of editors of anesthesia journals uh, actually looked at very carefully papers that have been published across a number of anesthesia journals. And this is the only specialty that I know of where People have systematically looked at some of these papers and they found, and these are just three examples, uh, and they, these are extreme examples which I've quoted, 
gentleman called Scott Rubin uh, did some studies on pain medication and published a number of papers, but actually they found that he never did these studies. Joachim yeah. Bolt uh, did studies on colloid research and 89 of, 100, of his 102 studies were considered fraudulent. <clears throat> Yoshitaka Fuji, who did a lot of work on post-operative nausea and vomiting, 212 of his 249 papers were investigated and over 150 papers had some fabricated data. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm not going to talk about plagiarism because somebody's going to talk about it immediately after me. Next slide, please. But it's an important concern as far as scientific misconduct and publication ethics is concerned. Does uh, publication misconduct occur in India? So in the BMJ of 18th of April, 1992, uh, the BMJ went on to say, we now wish to express concern about the validity of this paper. And if you go and look at these exact references, you will find the person whom they were uh, accusing of not being straight as far as the work was concerned. Next slide, please. And a short while later, uh, the Lancet came out with an expression of concern, again with work related to, uh, uh, to the same person in, in, in India. Next slide, please. So why do people do this? There's one uh, belief or theory that publish or perish. If you don't publish, you perish. You don't move up the academic ladder and therefore you need to publish. And because you need to publish, uh, there is uh, there is this need to try and uh, you know cut corners to be able to publish uh, whatever is available to you. And therefore, occasionally, you try and uh, play around with the data that you have. But to my mind, there is another reason, and that's pure simple greed. You get away with it the first few times, and then you say, what the hell? Nobody's ever going to figure out whether I've, I've done anything fraudulent. And therefore, I would go ahead and uh, continue to, to uh, publish fabricated and falsified data. And that's the only explanation I have for the three gentlemen whom I, three anesthesiologists whom I uh, spoke about a short while ago. Greed. Because, you know, I can understand somebody needs five papers. I can understand somebody needs 10 papers. I can understand somebody needs 15 papers and therefore at three stages does 45 fabricated papers. But hundreds of them that that's pure greed that's that's there's no other explanation pathological uh, uh, desire to go ahead and do whatever they were doing next slide please so the serious scientific misconduct is fabrication falsification and plagiarism plagiarism something that we are not going to talk about redundant publications to duplicate and salami again uh, we'll talk about these a little bit about conflict of interest and authorship and pseudo journals are something that I will not be talking about. Dr. Rajiv Kumar will be taking these uh, topics tomorrow. Next slide, please. So amongst the serious issues, I said there was fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Next slide, please. So fabrication, uh, what is fabrication? Making up data or results and recording or reporting them. Now you could do this while conducting research or you could do it while writing up research. Either way, you introduce information that you do not have, non-existent data, non-existent results, and you go ahead and present them as work that you've, that as results that have come from your work. Next slide, please. Falsification, on the other hand, involves you know, manipulating things. You already have information, but the information is not convenient or not conveniently placed to give you the results that you want. So you now start altering, concealing, withholding, either partly or completely, some bits and pieces of information. So completely, for example, I have 25 variables which are studied. If I remove two variables, then my results look much, much, much better. So why not do that? I just say that I haven't looked at these two variables. They were anyway not necessary to be looked at. So I do only 23 or 20 variables. So I completely uh, you know, get rid of those two, the data related to those two variables. On the other hand, I keep all the variables that I have. I keep all the data, but I start removing the outliers so that I get strength in my confidence intervals and my p-values. So that's another way of doing things. Uh, I could do this with clinical data, but I could also do it with photographs. 
Now, clinical data is sometimes a little more difficult to detect. And you need people who are uh, who understand methods, methodology, uh, statistics, uh, and uh, the way things are done a little better to be able to pick up this fraud and a strong sense of uh, a strong uh, suspicion of uh, there being fraud. Uh, but photographs are something that can be manipulated easily, but they can also be picked up a little more easily because there is software today available in most editorial offices. Which is uh, which can detect image manipulation. So a certain amount of image manipulation is acceptable to try and improve the quality of the reproduction, but beyond that is certainly not acceptable. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next. Yeah. So, uh, uh, sorry. Can we go back a bit? One slide. Yeah. So uh, based on all these things, uh, the, the group of people sat down in Singapore and uh, came out with something called a statement on research integrity. They said there should be honesty in all aspects of research, accountability in the conduct of research, professional courtesy and fairness in working with others, and good stewardship of research on behalf of others. Now, I think to my mind, for, for people who are senior, uh, what is important is the good stewardship of research. But for a lot of us, if we were honest and accountable ourselves, then we wouldn't get into these difficulties. If we, if we don't end up with a good research piece, it's okay. It's it's all right. It's part of the game. It's not. It's just not possible that every time you start doing something, you will get perfect results. That's now how, not how the world is made and that's not how things happen. Next slide, please. So a number of responsibilities listed out. I have no intent to, to read out and discuss each one of these. But uh, throughout your ethics sessions, all these would get covered in one aspect or the other. Next slide, please. They also said that responsible research publication is extremely important for people, for authors to present results clearly, honestly, and without fabrication, falsification, and inappropriate data manipulation. Adhere to publication requirements that the submitted work is original and is not plagiarized and has not been published elsewhere. Also take collective responsibility for submitted and published work. And this is something that got added to the authorship criteria of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, which Rajiv will talk to you about tomorrow. Uh, a, little, a little after uh, it was listed out by the Singapore group. And most important, they said the authorship should actually accurately reflect an individual's contributions to the work and its reporting. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm not going to cover plagiarism. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, we're now going to talk about redundant publications, which is the next most important thing that one comes across. Duplicate publications and salami publications. Now, duplicate publications is something easy to understand. I publish once and then I publish almost the same material or exactly the same material uh, once again. Salami publications is basically you've got a large data set and you split it up into small salami slices and publish this as small pieces of uh, publications or small separate publications, losing the impact of your work. So these are the two important redundant kind of redundant publications. Next slide, please. So what is duplicate publication? One, substantial overlap. It doesn't matter whether you've previously published in the print media and now you're doing it in the electronic media. Uh, you first done it in a print journal and now you're doing it in an online journal. No, it doesn't matter. Once it is published, it is published, whether electronically or whether in the print media. Why are editors bothered about duplication publication? How did it make a damn difference to them? It's a waste of resources. More importantly, today it misrepresents information. And also today it creates counting problems. If people like you, youngsters, would like to do a systematic review or meta-analysis, then that would create a counting problem. You might end up counting the same data twice 
sometimes even thrice because of a duplicate or a triplicate publication of the same data. So unless people declare that this information has been published previously, you will not be able to make out that this comes from uh, the same data set. Next slide, please. What is permitted? I can go ahead and publish an abstract of my research work as a conference proceedings. I could also publish it as an abstract in a journal, as long as it is clearly stated that this is an abstract presented at a conference. I could go ahead and present this data as a poster. All this is acceptable. I could even present this data at a press report, but not with actual scientific numbers in detail. So press reports of meetings is fine, but no data. Next slide, please. Does it occur? Does duplicate publication occur? So in 2007, four orthopedic journals looked at all the publications that they had published in the last few years, and they found 3% of publications were duplicate across their journals. In 2006, two plastic surgery journals looked at uh, the, the number of duplicate publications and less than 1%. 2004 ophthalmology publications somebody looked at and they were less than 1%. But in 2001, three surgical journals, it was 14%. So we surgeons seem to be the worst off as far as this is concerned. Next slide, please. So duplicate submission is another thing that's not permitted. I know a lot of you do this because you want to get a quick publication, especially if you have a job come offer coming up, if you have an interview coming up. But that's something that's not permitted. It leads to uh, a waste of resources, uh, peer review being uh, sent to uh, you know, multiple people and uh, a, a, in the end could lead to duplicate publication as well. What about simultaneous publication? You might have come across journals which publish uh, an editorial or a commentary or an opinion piece and at the bottom say that this is being published simultaneously in 5, 6, 8, 10, 15. Uh, in one recent instance, uh, the editor was in climate change and uh, it, over 200 journals, the, the article was submitted and published simultaneously. Now, this was an effort which was made prior to publication. The whole group actually contacted editors of all journals and said, look, this is what we've written up. This is a meeting that is coming up. It was the COP26, I think, which was coming up at that point in time. Heads of governments were going to be there. People who were climate activists were going to be there. And they felt that uh, this was something that was important and they wanted to talk about it. The health effects of climate change was something that they wanted to talk about it and it got published simultaneously in a number of journals. So when you declare this upfront and you seek permission from the editors and go ahead and publish, then you can do that. But usually very senior people who do it, usually groups and consortiums do this. Uh, and it's usually a cause which is uh, important in which uh, people go ahead and publish simultaneously. Next slide, please. What is Salami publication? I said multiple publication from a single data set. So often you do a retrospective study, you collect data, you collect pathology data, you get radiology data, you get clinical data, and then you split it up into three papers. Now that's something that's not a very great thing to do. How do I make out whether this should data set should be split up or remain a single piece? So if one paper is more informative, then it should remain as a single paper. If one paper is difficult to understand because it has too many ramifications, then maybe you could split it up into two. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Is it ever justifiable to publish, uh, do, to do duplicate publication? Yes, sometimes. So I could go ahead and publish in a local Indian, maybe indexed, maybe non-indexed, most likely non-indexed uh, journal. If I published in an indexed journal, then it would be available to the international community today. But if I published in, in a non-indexed journal, and the disease that I talked about suddenly became a matter of public health concern, then it would be extremely important for me to make this available to an international audience. I could do then a secondary or simultaneous publication in an international journal along with the local journal or sequentially one after the other. 
But in all instances, I would need to write to the editors and say that, look, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. Now, sometimes it's a very large study and you get two or three different conclusions for two or three different sets of audiences from the same data set. Because of these multidisciplinary conclusions, you need to go ahead and publish in different journals. So transparency is the key. If you get to do any of the, if you need to do any of these things, then you need to be absolutely transparent about this and inform the editors of both journals in which you're going to do this. Next slide, please. So here's an example. The BMJ and the New England Journal of Medicine uh, published uh, uh, two separate papers from a large study on glucose tolerance. Uh, one set of data was relevant to, to general practitioners, which the BMJ published, and one set of data was relevant to endocrinologists, which the New England Journal of Medicine published. Similarly, the American Journal of Cardiology and NEJM, there was data coming out from a very large study on syncope. And again, uh, two papers were published from the same data set. But in both instances, the authors informed the editors. They publicly justified the, their action. In fact, the editors decided to go ahead and publish their justification because it was so clear and uh, made it so easy for people to understand as to why they were doing this. And they accepted these articles and published the justification as well. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. So uh, I obviously went ahead and talked a little bit more about a few things, but uh, let's get back to duplicate submission. So duplicate submission is not permitted because it leads to unnecessary use of more than the required number of peer reviewers and good peer reviewers are a scarce commodity. It could also lead to simultaneous duplicate publication in two different journals. What is acceptable is simultaneous publication uh, across a large number of journals, but pre-decided, discussed with all the editors, and then gone ahead and published in that manner. Uh, more recently, uh, the most recent example that I can think of is uh, an, an editorial on climate change, which is published in over 200 journals simultaneously. Next slide, please. Okay, so salami publications uh, basically come from multiple publications. You uh, From a single data set, you get multiple publications. You do a retrospective study, you do data collection, you split the paper up for the radiology data, the pathology data, the clinical data, and you get three publications out of it. Not a great idea because a single paper was probably more informative. So how do you make out whether you should use, uh, you should do a single paper or multiple papers? Uh, I think the simplest way of doing it is, is a single paper more informative? Then if it is, then you should go ahead and do that. Uh, next slide, please. Is it ever justifiable to publish twice? So yes, there are instances where one might do this. It's possible that you could, uh, may somebody in China, for example, may have uh, during the, just before the start of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, had published a case report on COVID-19. And very, very soon, because the pandemic started, the person may have decided to go ahead and share this information across some international journals. Now, this could lead to secondary or simultaneous publication in a local as well as in an international journal. The other uh, situation where you may end up with multiple publications from the same data set is a very large study where you have multiple multidisciplinary conclusions. But what is key is to be transparent. Next slide, please. So here are two examples. BMJ and NEJM published two papers coming from the same data set on glucose tolerance. Similarly, they published, uh, the American Journal of Cardiology and NEJM published uh, two papers coming from the same data set, a large data set on syncope. The authors who split up their papers into two informed the editors, justified, gave them good reasoning. So the editors accepted the papers and published the justifications given by the, the authors. Next slide, please. So how does one decide? Is one paper more informative? Yes, go ahead and do one paper. If you're not sure, you can submit two papers and inform the editors of the journals that this is what we've done and this is why we've done this. Now, something that oncologists are very fond of is incremental follow-up. And they often want to keep publishing information related to incremental follow-up. 
Now, how frequently and how soon should we publish incremental follow-up? If we have a change in the way in which we are looking at information, that means the results are changing, the conclusions are changing, then certainly yes. Uh, with a small number of patients receiving a small chemotherapeutic regimen, uh, okay, receiving a chemotherapeutic regimen for a short duration of time, we may not have had too many adverse events. But as soon as we increase the duration, and that small number of patients now had a large number of adverse events. Now, this is information that you obviously want to share. But what is extremely important is that you should not have complete overlap of data. Next slide, please. Now, here's an example of somebody who had an image who we thought was a very interesting image. So he published it first in one journal, then in a second journal, and finally decided that he could go ahead and publish it the third time around in the New England Journal of Medicine. Unfortunately, he got caught out for the third publication. And then he had all three publications withdrawn. Next slide, please. So not something that you should want to do. Uh, my, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is conflicts of interest. Now, conflicts of interest exist when there's a divergence between an individual's private interests and his responsibilities to scientific publishing, such that a reasonable observer might wonder if the individual's judgment was motivated by those interests. And this definition is provided by the World Association of Medical Editors, BAMI. Next slide, please. And ties with activities that could inappropriately influence judgment financial, personal, or academic, and authors, reviewers, and editors all could have conflicts of interest and all need to be declared up front. Next slide, please. Just because you have a conflict of interest, it's not necessary that an editor will refuse to publish a paper. They will just publish your conflict of interest simultaneously along with the paper so that readers can make up their own minds as to how much they should accept those results with a pinch of salt or a cup full of salt or a bucket full of salt. Now, what are the kind of conflicts of interest? Financial uh, conflicts of interest. So I own stocks in a pharmaceutical company. I am a top-notch researcher. The pharmaceutical company asks me to do a trial. I do a trial. I don't get the results that I wish to get, but I try and twist the results slightly to give a positive aspect to the results. The paper gets accepted in the New England Journal of Medicine. The New England Journal of Medicine comes out on Thursday. On Friday, the pharma company's stocks go up. I make a killing by selling my stocks in the pharma company on the stock exchange. Now, that's financial conflict of interest. There are obviously other types of conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest, but this is one example. Uh, what about personal? Now, you and I could be doing cutting-edge research in the same field. We could all be wanting to get to the moon first, to the south pole of the moon. Unfortunately, the Russians' lander crashed on the moon. Our landed. But it could be possible, ooh, whisper only, we, our scientists may have done something. Now, if that was done, there would be a bias. Okay, We should not be doing that. So there could be a personal bias against somebody, you don't like somebody, and so on and so forth. There could be an academic conflict of interest. You're doing the same work, you're tying, buying for the same grants, the same jobs, the same promotions. And again, there could be a conflict of interest. If you were to go and evaluate the other person's grants, application for promotion, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. So this is not something I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. So we can just skip through the authorship slides and go to the last slide, I think. Because Dr. Rajiv Kumar is going to talk about authorship tomorrow. Last slide, please. Last slide, last slide. Yeah. So uh, plagiarism is something that we haven't talked about. Somebody is going to talk to you about it. Uh, there are different types of plagiarisms. Preventing it is important. Redundant publications are something that we should try and avoid. Conflict of interest is important to understand and declare upfront. Not declaring conflict of interest could be an issue. Declaring conflict of interest is unlikely to impact something as much as resulting in no publication at all, unless the conflict of interest is really very, very substantial. Thank you very much. I come to the end of the formal talk. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have.